Stanley Kubrick sets up what I think is the best scare in his 1980 film The Shining by the use of several techniques. He lulls us into a hypnotic trance with these eerily smooth shots of Danny riding his trike that portray almost a hotel's point of view. We follow him around ten corners in total, with the ambient sound slowly being overtaken by non-diegetic music. His first trike ride has no music at all. while the third and last has music that overpowers any diegetic sounds. But hold on, let's go back and start with Garrett Brown himself. He was not the first or last person to feel that Stanley Kubrick, a filmmaker known for his attention to detail and lengthy number of takes, could be unreasonable. Brown had to up his game despite previously working on hits like Marathon Man, Rocky, and Halloween. He sent his 1974 Steadicam demo reel throughout the industry, and as soon as Kubrick saw it, he fell in love. With the camera, I mean. Quick aside, the Steadicam, as you can see, allows the camera to move freely and, you guessed it, steadily, unlike traditional handheld cameras, and without the limitations of dollies or tracks, which are not as flexible and have to be hidden from the camera. Kubrick's meticulousness soon became evident when he warned Brown that a shadow in the demo reel could give away the Steadicam's secrets. Brown went back and, realizing he was right, cut out 14 frames from the reel. When one thinks of Kubrick's glowing telex, the timeline of events, and the way The Shining was shot, lit, and how the sets were built, it's hard not to think the Steadicam was a significant reason Kubrick chose The Shining in the first place, such as the effect it had on him. I think he could see the possibilities for its use presented by Stephen King's book. Its usage was so ingrained that Brown called his work on The Shining the Steadicam Olympics. In 1977, during the early days of pre-production, Kubrick asked Brown how low the Steadicam could go. He was presumably imagining the now iconic low angles of Danny pedaling around the Overlook Hotel to accomplish two things, set up its geography, important in any horror movie, and increased tension with each successive trike sequence by showing a young boy in the midst of a vast yet confusing and claustrophobic atmosphere. In order to make that happen, Brown had to invent low mode, where he reversed the counterweights, putting them on top and the camera on the bottom. They pushed or pulled Brown in his steady cam in a modified wheelchair, in which subtle tracks in the carpet can be seen. Brown said, I never even tried running after the kid. That would have been a joke. A kid on a big wheel can go about 70 miles an hour. The kid, of course, was Danny Lloyd, who emerged from a search that included more than 4,000 boys. Kubrick initially wanted the boy from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but his parents didn't want him in a horror movie. So Kubrick issued an open casting call for five to seven-year-old boys that looked Midwest American, which Lloyd was, being born and living in Illinois. Since Kubrick shot most of The Shining in England, UK laws came into effect, which restricted the amount of work minors could do on films to 3 hours a day and 40 days a year, excluding rehearsals. Not much time at all, so they had to make them count. Principal photography was done at Ells Tree Studios near London. Kubrick basically took over the entire studio, with sets ready all the time so they could shoot the film mostly in order, or move nearby when Danny reached his hours limit. One aspect that did save time but sprung from a creative decision to make the film look as realistic as possible was that most of the lighting would be practical. Those lights you see in the hotel, they're not just for show. When as much preparation goes into a film as one of Kubrick's, I believe it allows for more moments of serendipity. One of these was the sound Danny's trike made rolling around the overlook. The diegetic sounds make an almost musical rhythm, further captivating us. In contrast, Kubrick uses non-rhythmic and harmoniously incoherent music by East European composers Bela Bartok and Christoph Penderecki. The juxtaposition between the rhythmic sounds and non-rhythmic music enhances the movie's psychological power.
The booming sound strikes just slightly before we see anything unusual, giving us just enough time to think what the hell is about to happen. This is... And we're introduced to the most famous twins in film history, possibly inspired by this Diane Arbus photo from New Jersey in 1967. According to Lisa Burns, Kubrick was just looking for sisters, and it was only when he saw them that he decided twins would be creepier. In a recent interview, the Burns sisters said that Jack Nicholson was like a father to them on set, and they ate, and yes, played with Danny Lloyd. Kubrick builds tension by following Danny for almost two total minutes of triking around nine corners with steadily increasing, ominous, and discomforting music before confronting the twins in their murder scene. It hits harder because of the built-up tension and hypnotic effect of the audio-visual presentation. From writing to art design, casting to cinematography, editing to sound mixing, marketing to music, film, it has been said, is the ultimate artistic collaboration. No other director has made his crew feel more like just collaborators than Stanley Kubrick. From the DP to the PAs, they knew they were merely tools of a master craftsman, helping to achieve his vision, and this scene shows us that he knew how to use each one exceptionally. Come and play with us, Danny. Forever. And ever. And ever.